Okay, so hello and welcome to our next Coffee With interview. Today I'm talking with Lee Robson, the Manager of Community Resilience at Manningham Council. Hi Lee, I'm really... Hi Sharon, thanks for inviting me along today. Yeah, look, I'm really looking forward to our chat today and learning more about your work. But before we begin, as always, I would really like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting from today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Tell me, Lee, what land are you joining me from today? Well, I'm joining you from the Boonwurrung lands. Um, I'm within the city of Glenara. Fabulous. Thank you. And I noticed you have uh, a lovely fresh coffee um, for our Coffee With interview. Yes, <laughs> getting into the, into the swing of it. Excellent. So late 2020 has, you know, really highlighted the importance of being resilient um, out of all of the years that I've lived, definitely. Can you tell me some more about your current role as manager of community, re community resilience at Manningham and what it involves? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Uh, in uh, early March this year, when it became apparent that this pandemic was going to uh, be with us, I think, for some time, uh, the City of Manning and the CEO said, look, we're going to need someone to uh, work with us across the organisation to have a look at how the community is being affected by this and to uh, direct some action so that we can uh, be really flexible with our services and raise any issues as uh, they were coming about. So my main role is to oversee the community services for the council. So I was, I, was, I was pulled away from that and put into a dedicated role for all of this year to really look at how the community is being impacted by COVID and directing that back to the organisation to see how we could very quickly address that. Uh, my, you know, originally I was appointed until the 30th of, of September because we thought it would all be over quite quickly. Uh, I've been extended through until the end of December and now I'm starting to transition back into my community services role, but still having a little bit of oversight of what's happening in this space uh, because we're through most of the response phase uh, in this and uh, that's kind of set us up for the next bit of recovery. Uh, where we're, we've got some good plans about how we're going to address some of the emerging vulnerabilities in the community. Great. Look, that leads really well into uh, my next question, just thinking about the main impacts of COVID-19 on your community and how you are and will adapt to that going forward. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're focusing our activities into areas, community impact and economic impact. And uh, if I look at the economic impact first, uh, that's an area where council's playing a really important role at the moment. Um, we're trying to do what we can to support business, local business, uh, but it's also exposed a whole lot of really interesting things about Manningham. Manningham has been um, affected in an economic and employment sense um, more than any other municipality in Victoria. We're ranking number one for um, uh, loss of employment hours and unemployment. And uh, so that's exposed some vulnerability there where uh, we've got quite a narrow focus of the range of employers, uh, quite heavily uh, dependent on retail, uh, which of course has been you know, hugely hit. Um, and we know that that's had an effect on young people and women disproportionately because of the type of work. Um, so we're working very hard to try and um, connect businesses with the support that they can get from the, the state and federal government, grants and those sorts of things, help them navigate through red tape so that they can get what they need. And then also with hospitality businesses, trying to encourage them to open up in a different way so that they can continue to trade on the footpaths or whatever. In the community space, uh, any emergency exposes more vulnerability. So, so people who are already vulnerable are made more vulnerable through an emergency. So, you know, there are a range of issues, you know, housing and, and homelessness, um, uh, reliance on, on food relief, um, mental health impacts, family violence impacts. They're all things that um, we know have been evident during uh, the pandemic and we expect that the uh, 
uh, effects of that are going to be long lasting and quite profound. So, you know, our role as local government, what do we do? Well, we're trying to work with our partners uh, to be able to um, support the work they're doing, whether it's financially or through advocacy or uh, other sorts of support. We're also focusing on things like loneliness and social isolation, because that's been, you know, profound. And what we're hearing from the community is that uh, cohorts who were not particularly uh, showing up as, as being uh, affected by loneliness and isolation, you know, no surprise, we're seeing uh, a whole new cohort of people who are experiencing the, the mental and, and um, physical health impacts of loneliness. So uh, we're, we're doing some dedicated work around loneliness and looking at how we can work with our partners in the community to try and address that because again that's not something that's going to go away. Things like volunteering, the whole shift towards um, um, looking for different sorts of volunteers because vol uh, Manningham has the highest rate of volunteering in Victoria as a, as a mm. municipality. Mm. Possibly also because we've, we've got the um, you know, an ageing cohort in our population as well. But when those volunteers weren't able to go to their regular volunteering gigs because they, they were in the um, sort of the target group and didn't want to be exposed, um, the flow on effect was, was huge. So we had community organisations who were relying on volunteers and then couldn't get them. Uh, and then for those volunteers who, you know, for the large part are very active people in our community, the personal impact on them of not being able to contribute was profound as well. And how could they connect with those sorts of things? So um, there's a whole lot of new things that have come out of this that um, I think it's really interesting to observe the effect. And so what I'm trying to do now is gather all of that information. We've done quite a lot of surveying with our community to, to hear what the impacts are for them and what they're looking for. And I'm gathering that and then feeding that back into our planning processes uh, so that we can try and cover off on those things. And um, in terms of timing, you know, we have a four year council plan and a four year municipal health and wellbeing plan. Well, they're currently under development for the next four years because we've just had a council election. So the timing's quite good in a way because we'll be taking all of that information about what's happened in our community with COVID and able, we'll be able to put that into our council plan and a health and wellbeing plan to say, I think the pillars are the same, but how we respond to those pillars is going to be a little bit different mm -hmm. because all the evidence says that when you have a profound economic downturn uh, and a, a upheaval in a, in a community sense that the recovery is going to be years and years rather than months and months. So, you know, we need to strap ourselves in for what is going to be a long game here. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be doing continual surveying and engagement with our community to see what new issues are going to pop up because at the moment people are still in that phase of, oh my God, we're out of lockdown, isn't that great? But we're not really seeing some of the effects of uh, the, the social implications of COVID yet. Family violence is an example in that um, we know that there was an uptick in family violence, but the actual um, impact of that in people trying to seek help um, may not yet have surfaced because of the lockdown and, and the restricted situation. So they're, they're all things we're going to be keeping a close eye on. It's, there's some incredible challenges there, um, Lee. I wonder, you know, how, how do you, what, what excites and motivates you in your role when you've got those challenges? Also, you mentioned the opportunities, but still a really challenging time. It is a challenging time. And, and you know, there were times when um, it felt like the pandemic was all I was eating, sleeping, breathing, living. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, we're all working from home and, and dealing with this during the day and then feeling it at night when you're in your own space, you know, it can be a little overwhelming at times. But the things that really motivate me is uh, are, are those opportunities. You know, this is an opportunity. There are some good things that have come out of this. And I'm really trying to focus the organisation's attention on what are the learnings what are the good things that have come out of this that we want to build on 
what are the things that uh, we need to let go of to be able to continue to work in a much more agile way. And just watching how our organisation, and I think this is probably us as a community as much as anything, have recognised that there is a common purpose to stick together and get through this and serve our community. So what I saw in our organisation is everyone from people who mow the parks through to the litter collectors, uh, through to our, our home care workers, everyone was really united about our community's doing it tough. We need to get out there and deliver better services than we've ever delivered before mm. and do it quickly. And that's what I saw. I saw people just rally and really raise, raise their game because they were really motivated by purpose. And it was great, you know, and, and being part of a team to be able to, um, as we have, we've had a crisis management team to kind of meet really regularly and plan what we're going to do and support each other through that. Um, was just so affirming, you know, you just kind of think, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're not getting it right all the time, but most of the time we're hitting the mark and delivering because we want to do something that's good for the community. And, you know, making a difference is a strong motivator, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you've talked, of course, we've all been working for home, from home for quite some time now. What sort of strategies have you found have helped you with working from home? Well, you know, it's, it's been a challenge at times, I have to say. I've learned a lot about myself through this time. I always thought I was a, a bit, you know, quite, quite on the introverted scale. But what I've learned is that they're, they're not quite so much as I thought. I really need people around me to motivate me and to, you know, get the ideas flowing. So um, I've, I've, set, I've set myself some boundaries around cutting off work at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, early on, it was probably a glass of wine, which wasn't helping both my <laughs> physical health and my weight. So what I'm doing now is just trying to have a brief walk around the block at the end of the day and turning my computer off rather than just letting it run so that, you know, it, I, I haven't um, uh, shut it down. And, uh, because the temptation was to keep checking my emails, you know, all through the night um, and those sorts of things. Um, yeah. Very, very, very helpful advice. And I think, yeah, when, when we realised, uh, you know, we were going to go back into lockdown, that, that glass of wine that possibly got us through the first um, bit of lockdown, we kind of thought, oh, no, maybe we need to look at some other options. So, yeah, well, yeah, it was going on for a while. And I, <laughs> I, I really did stop and think, no, nah, this is not a good coping strategy. And I wouldn't have done that when I was coming home from the office every day. So, yeah. The other thing I did, and this is really weird, but I, I do wear proper shoes every day. I've never worn my Ugg boots or my slippers while I'm sitting at my desk. That's something I do at the end of the day is I, I change out of, out of shoes. Um, I mean, I, I wear jeans and track pants, but uh, <laughs> it, the fluffy slippers seemed um, a bridge too far. And, and that became kind of emblematic of, I guess, just relaxing at the end of the day is to slip those, those shoes off. Yeah, for sure. So exciting that Melbourne's finally moved out of our second very long and um, tiring lockdown. So what are you looking forward to getting back into with, with our newfound freedom? Oh, well, it's just great to get together with um, family and friends. Um, and, you know, I have, I have two elderly parents in aged care and I haven't been able to visit them um, for many months and recently I'm, I'm now able to visit them in person, obviously supervised and fully kitted up. The, this, uh, the aged care facility they're in is very cautious. But, you know, when, when you're in your 90s, you don't, um, mum and dad just couldn't relate through the Zoom screen. They did, couldn't really see it and hear it very well. So I feel like we've lost some valuable time there, but it's so great to be able to connect with them as well. And um, I've been out for a, for a meal in a restaurant with my, my family and um, that was just so sweet, you know. Um, and one of the things I've noticed uh, is how nice everyone is at the moment. You know, we're all so grateful to have come out of this lockdown that 
the wait staff, the people you just bump into in the supermarket and you apologise and then you laugh because we are all so grateful for what we've got at the moment. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed is there's just a bit of a sense of exhaustion amongst people. Yeah. I feel like we've collectively been kind of holding our breath uh, for months, like a sort of a, a background noise level of stress. Yeah. And to kind of exhale a bit, yes, there's, there's sort of a bit of jubilation, but there's also this sense of exhaustion and fatigue. It's been a really trying year and... Um, you know, I, I have lots of people in my team who say to me, oh, you know, I've been, I've got nothing to complain about. You know, I've had a job the whole way through and I'm doing okay. Um, I've got nothing to complain about, but they're clearly a bit off kilter. And I think it's important to recognise that even for those of us who have had employment and perhaps have not financially been affected through this time, it's okay to acknowledge the fact that this has been hard and give ourselves to permission to kind of go, yep, that was pretty awful. We're coming out the other side, um, but don't deny it. I kind of don't push away that sense of having been through something that was pretty tough. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just one of those things that every single person has been affected by. Um, it's such a shared experience and all in different ways, of course, but yeah, really important to, to acknowledge that we, we've all been affected in different ways, but we have been affected. Yeah. I read something the other day that said the anxiety is around um, all of this being uncertain. It's about the level of uncertainty is quite unsettling. As humans, we like to have certainty. We like to know this is where we're going and, I'll be here at that time or I'll have a holiday there. I'll see my family. And because it was changing all the time, as well as the restrictions, the level of change that we were going through constantly having to absorb new things you had to think about and, and new ways of doing things, that that, that level of uncertainty um, is not sort of natural for us as humans. And, of course, it's going to cause a bit of a stress response in us. Yeah, definitely. So you've talked about the challenges of working from home and the things that you've perhaps learned about yourself, but is there anything that you've secretly enjoyed about being stuck at home and working from home in lockdown? Well, I don't miss the commute every day. Um, <laughs> my, I, you know, I would spend nearly two hours in a car every day to go to work and I would try and use that time productively to listen to podcasts and um, uh, keep myself sort of engaged and up to date on things. But when you have an extra two hours in your day, there are, there are things you can do. Mm. Um, and I, I've kind of loved that. A uh, bit more time to not be rushing the whole time. I mean, I'm not usually not wearing makeup at home or having to dress up or, or whatever. Um, so I've used that time to do a bit more exercise. Um, I'm you know, doing more cooking from, from scratch, like many people are, uh, because you can just whip out between Zoom meetings to take something out of the oven or, um, or whatever. Um, so yeah, that, that commute time, which seems like such a dead time and such a waste, two hours back in the day. <laughs> I'm a bit reluctant to go back into PR traffic, you know, for an, for an hour's commute on the way to work. So yeah. Well, perhaps we can maintain some of those benefits. Yeah. Maybe not every day, but some days. Well, we've surveyed our staff and, and you know, many, most in fact, who are office-based staff want to have the blend of home and office space working going forward. And we're proof we can do it. I mean, that's the thing, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that my children are grown up and I didn't have to homeschool children. For those, you know, it was predominantly women who were, and I work with many women who were just like the swan on the water but underneath their legs were going crazy because they had a couple of kids at home that they were trying to do remote learning with they were were heavily involved with their work some of them with a hugely increased workload through covid um and uh, we would forgive them the glass of wine at the end of the day i think because it's been really tough for those people so you know if more flexibility around the workplace is the 
one of the benefits that comes out of this ongoing to support particularly women who have the lion's share of those home responsibilities, whether we think that's fair or not, that's what the research is telling us. Um, then isn't that great? You know, that's great for being family friendly workplaces and really living that and sort of walking the talk. So, you know, all power to them, I think. Absolutely. Lee, that's a great note to finish on. I just wanted to thank you such so much for your time this morning. It's been really fantastic to hear about the work that you've, you've been doing on resilience in the, the Manningham community and we really, really appreciate it. Thank oh, you. thanks Sharon. It's been a pleasure. It's been lovely to have a chat with you.